I'm happy to be here. Um, I was able to attend, I think, all the last Hack, Hack and Fest, the second one. And uh, I was kind of, uh, you get up here and present. So, so it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, I was able to share some of my passion then in Deadwood for host-based forensics. And I'm hoping to give uh, equally enthusiastic presentation. I've been working, I'll tell you about myself as, as we share these 45 minutes together, but I've been working a lot lately with folks who are pivoting into cybersecurity. So uh, those who are interested in leaving oh, there's some fascinating stories of people that have been working in other careers, but they're pivoting into cybersecurity and it really has been an incredible experience kind of coaching them uh, both for the job uh, kind of search aspects, but, but also sharing with them and trying to convert them. Everyone comes into this field thinking, I want to be a pen tester. I want to be a hacker on the shells on box and everybody shells on box. But I've been, and you can join me in this undercover operation. I have been trying to bring them into the blue team inside the house. And it kind of sells itself when you say, this is where the jobs are. <laughs> but uh, hopefully if, if you're not already in this space, I will convince you, oh, I need to get down with the forensics slash incident response triage. My true, my true goal is to bring awareness to memory forensics, how you can use it in incident response. So uh, I'll, I'll showcase the problem first as I venture into my first slide. I am well aware that security operations centers, analysts sitting behind single panes of glass are, are overwhelmed with data and alerts these days. Uh, you know, the quality of life suffers <laughs> as uh, you know, our alerts may not be of high fidelity. So oftentimes we're drawn into this space where 80% of the alerts that I'm looking at are false positives, maybe even higher. So I'm not trying to complicate life uh, with the scenarios that I'm throwing out. Uh, you're Essentially, I'm going to be convincing you, oh, it's time to pivot and hit the host for more data. Ah, and I, I know that more data is uh, two curse words, more and, and data put together, which is quite fearsome. So I just want to start off by defining the problem by, you know, perhaps building some touch points with the audience today. It's like, don't give us more work. Don't give us more actions to take to bring in more data. But you know what? Um, so here we are, the, the definition of the problem. And the survey agrees. Sumo Logic did a survey in 2020, just last year, polling with the participants. It was folks that work in this space, work in cybersecurity. And those are my dogs. Sorry about that. I will say that specifically, Sumo Logic was querying the state of security operations. So one of the questions that they asked participants is, hey, do you have a problem with high volumes of alerts? Whoa, I am not at all shocked to see that 99% of the respondents said, oh yeah, yeah, our security staff has a problem with a high volume of alerts. Yeah, where is that 1%? Uh, I w yeah, can I, can I sign up to work there? But hey, most everyone who was up against the survey question said, yep, there is an issue. Pivot over to the second question that I pulled out of this survey uh, set of results. It focuses on uh, alert fatigue. So of the respondents, 83% said, hey, this security staff that I work with or am a part of suffers from alert fatigue. So again, I understand the problem, don't wanna make it worse, but there is this, uh, sometimes there's quite an ambiguous uh, interpretation of alerts and you do need more data to ascertain, okay, is this true positive or what is the scope of this hit? Antivirus found, re this is my example for the week, Rubios, our antivirus hit on, detection of Rubios. Anyone know what Rubios is? Oh, I bet I do have some folks who are down with their ransomware operators. Rubios is a tool that it, it conducts quite simply uh, some of my Kerberos capabilities. So it's a Kerberos uh, attack tool amongst, don't simplify things. But you know, you're thinking like, well, how can I contextualize that? 
how do I get the information needed to say, okay, yes, it was just a researcher, or this is seriously the only thing the antivirus detected in the whole slew of detection techniques that were being employed by an adversary, and I need eyes on this box right now. Okay, again, I'm not the only one. We, because now I've built some consensus, we aren't the only ones that feel like the problem is too much data. So I quote CrowdStrike. This is straight up on their splash page. It is pure vendor propaganda, but uh, unlike a lot of those be the hunter pitches, this is straight up truth. Look, data alone is merely the starting point. Drum roll. Without context, having a massive pool of raw security data can be more of a hindrance than a help. Putting data in context enables hunters to extract insights from their data sets quickly and efficiently. So you'll note the five pivots we're going to be moving through today, fingers crossed, uh, that we get through all of them, the five pivots that we're going to be moving through today scream, hopefully, scream at you, you need more context. And we're pivoting to the host to find that which is required to ascertain. Is this more than what it appears? Or is it simply, hmm, we got is it some... Uh, IT professional trying to run Rubius and uh, he doesn't know what it does. I, ah. All right, the first IR pivot that we're going to be focusing on, our lasso, is fileless malware. So you're thinking, depending on the detection capabilities that you have in play, you may have like zero visibility into what's happening in the context of a process. Yeah, so maybe uh, you have an EDR tool doesn't give you visibility into process changes, API, APIs, yeah, Windows APIs. So file with malware can evade detection in all of these different categories. You may not have, you know, push the I believe button if you're like one of those elite, mature, well down the road of maturation security teams that has, you figured it out and you fine-tuned all of your host-based endpoint detections that are going to alert all the time correctly on a API, rogue suspicious API calls. So I present to you the whole fileless malware quandary. And in order to get good visibility on what's happening in the context of a typically, usually benign process, but now we have uh, you know, maybe some injected code that's running in the context of this process, how do we gain visibility into it? And so I pitched to you acquiring memory. Like, oh, I knew the sales pitch was coming. I knew the memory sales pitch was coming. But I understand that dumping the entire contents of memory these days as RAM capacity continues to creep up, 64 gigs is quite commonplace in, well, maybe not even your power users. Maybe you have 64 gigs throughout your environment now. Pulling back 64 gigs of data is not the definition of real time. So in, and in some cases, like when I was working at the manufacturing agriculture company, we had segments of our environment where the bandwidth was terrible. Yeah, so very, very remote systems where there was no way pulling back 64 gigs of RAM to gain that visibility into process. Process address space would have even been, been feasible. So, you know, suggestion number one, kick back, see what your EDR tool can do endpoint detection and response tools. They may or may not have the ability to give you a tighter read on which process is acting anomalously. But if you can pinpoint it to a process, then consider the beauty of what attackers are doing today. Consider using the same technique that our ransomware operators are using or those folks who are right now, as we sit here talking, exploiting exchange vulnerabilities on-prem. So they're actually going in and targeting one particular process's address space when they're dumping memory. Which one is it? Which one is the one I'm talking about? Well, we see a lot of times that our tools like proc dump and task manager and uh, all of these different techniques, will, it will dump out the process address space of LSAS. So might we consider doing that same type of triage collection on processes that are exhibiting anomalies. This is what I pose to you. So if you're looking at this beautiful picture, shout out to whatever EDR product I pulled this from, we have WinWord that kicked off 
And then we see an instance or an invocation of Windows management instrumentation, WMI invoking cert util. Now I'm a huge fan of cert util, but I know, I know because I use it to do base 640 coding. I use it for all kinds of things, no joke. But the only reason I know about cert util being on the operating system it, as a native Windows utility is because the attackers got there first. They started misusing, repurposing cert util for downloading split files, downloading you know, the second stage payload, incredible stuff. There's other things you can do with it too, but I see cert util, and this is just parent child relationships. And I see that WMI is also spawning the run DLL32.exe. The presence of both things might tip me off. Which process here would I target? Uh, it's like, okay, I see these, maybe I'll target all three processes and still walk away with faster triage collection than if I were to go after the entire memory dump of 64 gigs of RAM. It turns out all of this would be, ooh, enticing. But you might ask yourself first, what are my command lines? What are my command line arguments of my run DLL32 or my sort util? Or, that's a fantastic question. So, okay. We're going to consider dumping a processes address space. If we have that targeted information, we'll go back and do that. So uh, with that in mind, we'll focus on fileless malware. Now, this is a pretty broad category, right? Fileless malware, since I'm such a fan of memory forensics, I'm always like, oh, that's talking about the malware that's memory resident only. Well, not so much, not so much. It, memory resident malware is just a subset of fileless malware. So you could throw in that malware that supplants itself in registry keys and then does a nice daisy chaining of invoca inv invocation of the scripts that it supplanted in the registry, that's fileless. Some people think I'm cheating by re redefining, but no, it's still considered fileless. We also have fileless attacks subset, hopefully you'll agree with me here, the way Lobins are fileless. Nothing new being introduced to the box. Nothing, no changes occurring on that file system, that master file table. So, so you could say, hey, I'm going to run cert util, and in the context of memory, pull something down and feed it into the cert util process address space file less, I'm using what's on the box, I'm living off the lands, and uh, I feel pretty cool about it too. So shout out to Matt Graber, who is uh, attributed to coming up with Lulbins, living off the land, I love that, I love that. But we're going to see that these techniques are everywhere, and the reason, what's the draw for an attacker? If I'm using the tools that are there already, I'm not having to download additional binaries to directories that are protected as a standard user. You know, I'm, I'm just using what's already there. And what's already a part of my allow list, right? If I have allow listing software, application allow listing software that's based on location, it's based on the publisher, uh, digital signature, blah, 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 blah. I'm able to get around that as an attacker. So, what I propose, and this is pivoting into a detection strategy, is one of the reasons you might be led to really have to pull more context from the host. Remember, it's all about context and making decisions about alerts. You may see processes that are acting anomalously, like the cert util. So uh, I don't see cert util holding a connection, pulling down a substantial uh, data, <laughs> writing files to the file system. So that is an example of a process that's like pivoting out of its usual lane, its, its typical definitions or standards of behavior. And we see this throughout, you guys recognize this, my screenshot of the MITRE attack matrix, we see examples of low bins, low bass uh, techniques throughout the kill chain and throughout our attack matrix. And so we anticipate that if I see the misuse or abuse of one of these native Windows tools, that most likely there'll be others because so frequently, and actually this is more than just the attack matrix, this is one of my favorite tools, which is called Carrot. Thank you very much, MITRE. It is the exploratory tool uh, of attack, attacker repository. So I have actually, I love the COBOL group. I 
created this screenshot after I had selected the cobalt group and all of those techniques that are associated with cobalt group are right there highlighted for us. Of course you can do this with Navigator. All right, all right. But my, my thing is, Carrot's so easy to use. I love it. But some of these are low bins that will then invoke another living off the land uh, native binary. So I propose to you, take a look at this blown up process list. Maybe it's a process list that you're not used to looking at. It's a screenshot of PS list volatility output that enumerates processes that were active at the time and memory was collected. So a, you have perhaps a different way of viewing process lists. Maybe it's through the lens of Tanium, returning active process. Maybe you have a PowerShell script that goes and aggregates, pulls processes from all of your systems on the enterprise. But hey, some of us view, <laughs> view all analysis and investigation through the lens of memory. So join me here. I see it windward, and we'll focus on that in a minute, but I, I'm scrolling down and I see PowerShell with, with its accompanying con host, search filter host, throw this one out. Hopefully you can see my arrow. <laughs> I'm trying to be, oh, I don't know. Okay, third from the bottom, reg SVR32. Now, reg SVR32 is a native utility, isn't it? And you know, what is that sucker used for? Hmm. Reg SVR32 is used to register unregister DLLs, ActiveX objects, but it's also one of those. Oh, it's one of those. Yeah, if we're in the context of fileless attacks, if I see, well, this is where it gets a little strange. I see three different instances in my process list of WinWord. And if we were to track it through, we can see that second process. This is the start time, this is the exit time. So really it's only running from 31 seconds after the minute to 32 seconds after the minute. That's hardly at all. So I'm thinking like when I first saw this process list, I was like, I think that WinWord has crashed. What would you see if WinWord had crashed, like collapsed in on itself? Isn't there normally an apology being made and some type of error reporting? So typically you see uh, that you'll have the Windows Error Reporting Manager pop up and that would have been in my process list, but I don't see that. I see one close of WinWord, I see another WinWord that only lasts a second, and then I see the WinWord that is currently running with no exit time followed by the PowerShell, followed by the Reg SVR32. Now, you, like me, I am a huge fan of that oof, command line. Like, I don't go and dump memory from a host until I have kind of a full, full confidence and understanding of the reason why, because this costs time. It's extra cycles, and I wouldn't advise my analysts just to go and look for uh, terminated win words. Not the case, but take a look as we uh, look at the command line of my running WinWord, maybe your suspicion will grow. I don't know. I see WinWord running from the correct location and you're going to get visibility on where WinWord or Word is launching from for each of these, even the terminated processes. What you're not going to get for the terminated processes is the command line instantiation. You only have that visible from memory uh, in the running process. And I'm, you're probably thinking, Sysmon does way better than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you bring in your auditing, you bring in all of that stuff, and, and you're going to have visibility and capture on command line for previously run instances of WinWord. All right, but we only have present in memory based on the process environment block, this command line here, which shows the active doc that's open in the context, at least when this when we're launched, we share the active doc. Anyone suspicious, first off, you're like, oh, this is a free Microsoft Windows VM. You're right, totally, this is one of the testing VMs. But how often do you see users opening files that are right off of their profile? I'd say this is a misstep from uh, the malware author who is intending to drop this in a location, this 42322.doc is being written to a location that this standard user can write to. So got it, check. But the fact that it's being open right off of the profile, it's, it's an anomaly. It's strange, okay? So like, I, still don't, I still don't buy it. Well, if you continue on down in your extracted command lines, 
that you pulled from the running processes, you're going to see the command line of this reg SVR32. And I've already, it's like, darn it. I wish I could have done a drum roll and not already told you it was an instance of a squibbly do type of attack. So reg SVR32, as we previously defined it, it's a native Windows tool used to register unregistered DLLs, active X controls, but it's also used by attackers. And remember my affinity to the Cobalt group. This is a, a machine that was compromised with uh, malware sort of really packaged into a weaponized war doc attributed to the Cobalt group. And they're named that because, well, like many threat actors today, they were kind of first to ground with using Cobalt Strike incessantly. Yeah, they were like, <laughs> there's no differentiator now. It's true, it's true. So I'm looking here at just the command line uh, instantiation of this reg SVR32, and we can see it's pointing to a text file, which strange, is it really a text file? No, it's not. It's actually um, an SCT com scriptlet. And in the invocation with this scribbly do invocation, have a whole slew of parameters here. But what really matters is the, the content of this SCT file. These contain either VB script or J scripts, and we're going to find out for ourselves exactly what's happening here. But you can see just the invocation, the pattern of invocation is well recognized as being an attack that allows said adversary to utilize a native Windows tool to get around application, allow listing, software and, and really uh, execute either additional downloads or execute script that's going to do the callback that's going to be responsible for whatever nefarious act is going to happen next. So who is excited about going in and trying to dig out this VB script or this J script? Well, I'm thinking, is it even possible? Well, do I have access to this text file? Is that something I can reach out and grab a copy of? Now that I've seen it in the command line instantiation, can I reach out and grab a copy of it? It turns out not possible that it actually is not present on the file system by the time the, the investigator goes to pull it off of the file system with the EDR product. So the only location where you're going to find this text file is right now in the context of memory. And you're like, go, I totally am down with this. Let's figure this out. So. I am showing you how to minimize your search space because we know we're looking for J scripts or, or VB scripts. Minimize your search space by taking that entire memory image, which I think in this case was four gigs, <laughs> entire memory image and dumping just the process address space of the reg SVR32. So what belongs to reg SVR32? Sweet, that's clean. In fact, let's go in and minimize that a little bit more and just ask ourselves which areas of this process's memory is just mm, read write. I don't want to execute. I don't want to, I don't want to execute. It's, I want a copy of this uh, SCT file. And that's going to be somewhere in process address space that belongs to reg SVR32 in read write. So in like heap memory and uh, you know, files that are memory mapped into the process center space. So that's what we're doing here. We're invoking volatility, pointing it to the entire memory image, specifying the profile, nice. And then we're, I'm running a tool that Jake Williams actually created for volatility, one of the profiles, dump wmem. And dump wmem takes the dash n, so I can just say, hey, dump out the process address space, read write memory sections for a process that goes by the name of regsvr, dump it to this output directory that I've already created. Now I pivot in and I run strings against my dump file. So I've taken this four gig, minimized it down to just one process. And I've been quite selective about which memory sections based on protection level I'm interested in. Again, the goal, what are we doing here? <laughs> the goal is to go in and recover that J script. And so now I have individual memory sections that have been dumped out to DMP files. And I'm looking, is this cheating? I'm looking for just J scripts. And I find it, what? I know, I, I did find it. So it's highly obfuscated, not even gonna go there because that's another talk and kudos to whomever is going to step up and be like, done, simple. But you can see it's, it's some of the obfuscation is just splitting, uh, some of it's substitution. 
nevertheless, I'm like, sweet. I have a project I can now give my junior analyst to keep them busy, deobfuscate, reconstruct this. Let's answer the question of what it does. Another way in which you can approach the analysis of these memory sections. I love it. I love it. Shout out to the FireEye tools. Their GitHub is full of good stuff. You know, they have those VMs that you can download. Oh, they just came out with a threat intel VM. They had one for malware analysis. They came up with what commando is the one for the pen testing, fire, red team VM. But I should, anyone know what the threat intel one is called? Should have this memorized like the back of my hand. But never, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, I'm waiting. I'm looking into the uh, Discord channel to see if anyone's going to help me. No, nope, you must continue without that knowledge. This tool from their GitHub, FireEyes GitHub, is String Sifter. And you can invoke it, flare strings, and you give it, say, hey, just show me that which is consistent with malicious behavior. There you go. Thank you very much for dropping the link. Hidden hippo crouching. <laughs> I love it. So I'm like, dang, I had no idea. Look at these. In fact, this malware does do a, a attempted you can see get requests to a eight a eight and that's an that's unusual let's go i i we rarely see well before I, i've rarely seen uh a, 480 calls to 8888, but maybe I'm just sheltered. But I think that's some of the anomalies. Uh, it's looking to see, do, do I have internet access? And clearly a bit random on the end of this uh, URL. So I give this to you. Example number one, let's see if I can properly frame it as we pivot into example number two. Hmm, framing. It all started with, we know that there are techniques that are hard to create detections for living off the land binaries, capturing the misuse of native Windows tools. What can we look for? And this thread will continue throughout the other four examples. She's not going to make it. She's not going to make it. Let's talk about anomalous behavior from trusted applications. I told you it was going to be very similar in vain. So it's some of the, the things that you can look for. And you can create detections for this is not just a manual you know, I, just, I had to commit five hours to look at process lists and ask questions. But no, you can create signatures that will automatically detect some of these unusual behaviors. You just have to come to an understanding of what normal looks like in your environment said me for the last 10 years that I've been teaching cybersecurity. Ah, um, so some of the things to look for, and I know that my threat hunt team has created detections for these very things, spawning unusual processes, so parent-child relationships, wah, 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 of course, but you can create detections for anomalous parent-child relationships and then go in and refine these detections because there's always outliers. So spawn, processes that are spawned by unusual processes. So there's two things there. I look back and say, okay, MS build, really good one these days, right? Why are attackers using MS build? Mm. They're not going to drop a binary on the system that immediately is flagged by AV. They're going to drop their code and compile it on the target system. Oh, maybe uh, with my MS build capability. So MS build, if I see it being spawned by a PowerShell, if I see it being spawned by something, a run DLL32, I want to um, first ask, is that normal in my environment? But then I can wrap some detections around it. So that would be, hey, I look back and say, who spawned MS builds? Unusual. But then there's also MS build spawning notepad.exe. What the heck is going on there? That doesn't usually happen. So there's two facets to this, two areas of focus, two captures, and I understand how difficult it is in um, environments that are particularly um, accommodating to legacy. <laughs> because some things that works on XP Windows 7, like you could immediately rule out, like Windows 10 just doesn't do it like that. So. Yeah, understand, understand that this might be a, a bridge that requires an incredible effort to get to, but not impossible. It's not too far. So the third bullet, uh, processes that uh, are generating unusual network activity, like Notepad, come on, and you're not supposed to be communicating outbounds you know, to some remote port. You've got to be kidding me. So I know Notepad would never let me down like that, but this is a, is a huge detection strategy 
currently in play and you know suffering the uh, consequences of continued refinement for for our SOC as as we continue to try to be more proactive in this space. So it's not about atomic and computed indicators, as we know. It's about pivoting in and getting ahead of my attacker. How can I anticipate what that MD5 is going to be? We need to build in the stinking thing on my box. So forget that. We're going to be really creating a set of detections that allow us to pick out anomalies from the stack. This one's my favorite, though, absolutely my favorite manner in which I can tell a process is acting anomalously is did it like we did uh, with the observation of windward it only ran for a second what like why was that and actually I didn't do the full explanation task kill was why it only ran for a second task kill does not generate a windows error reporting at least in this case it did not so it was like task kill the first one task kill the second one and then windward spun up and loaded that doc which was in fact the fake doc that was supposed to con dope any of your users that were sitting behind it so that windward one that only ran a second weird but there's other processes that we should be on the lookout for that have no business running for like hours on end and passing a lot of data from external sources. It's crazy. So the one that me and my buddy crafted in our attack scenario, <laughs> I'm exhausted listening. What? Come on. The, the, the scenario that me and my buddy crafted is we uh, had BG info and you know, BG info it uh, paints a desktop that shows system information and you can customize that sucker. So it's a system internal tool, check it out. But you can get it to run a script, script that we got our BG info to run shoveled a interpreter shell. So reverse shell called out to the attacker, the attacker then proceeded, my buddy was the, was the, the guy, the attacker then proceeded to push additional capabilities. So you have BG info running for an extended period of time if you're uh, cognizant of Shrum system resource utilization monitor, this is a database that's being populated, updated every hour that shows which process owns the traffic that's coming in, going out, and it's freaking fascinating, so Shrum. And that will help also to capture anomalies. Like, what are you doing talking about that? And why is BG info, why is the duration of runtime Bringing hours at length. Yeah, why does it have a remote connection to that IP? All of these things, you choose your detection strategy. I, I threw those up because I wanted to convince you that you would get to the same, you know, draw the same conclusion that I would, but we would just take different routes in getting there, right? Fingers, again, fingers crossed that there are multiple ways to come upon ownage, system ownage. So I give to you visualization tool, shout out to JP Cert. I think they just revved a meeting they just updated log on tracer. Some of you are probably in the know on their Sysmon visualization tool as well. For log on tracer, they're anticipating you're going to load, you're gonna load in to the Neo4j instance uh, security event logs from Windows machines. And you will be able to, no, no beautiful picture here, but you'll be able to pick out the lineup unusual activity based on log on. So if you have this typical behavior of this standard user on box, that's going to create a pattern. Attacker starts making use of maybe a service account, an account with associated SPN. And you're like, whoa, that's never been seen before here. And I can, I can show that when I turn this data into a beautiful colorful picture. Um, and so check out JP Search period, but their uh, visualization tools are incredible and, and certainly on, on the cheap because they're free as long as you have uh, the opportunity to set up an instance with dependencies. <laughs> so um, we, we can also question and this. This is where I injected ping. We can go about, I know Tanya is pretty good at this, although it's, it's resource intensive on endpoints, you can go about but creating a baseline of what are the DLLs that are loaded in native Windows processes? <laughs> like what's normal look like based on dynamic link libraries, the dependencies that a process brings to bear when it's normally running. So I'm showing you ping. Do it, do it. Process Explorer. Love you, Mark Krasinovich. 
I'm showing you Ping and its DLLs. Ping obviously has uh, the WS2 underscore 32 dot DLL loaded into its process address space because it is talking on the network raw sockets, raw sockets. But once I inject it, do it, do it. Now I'm looking at the memory dump of Ping, which was in fact running. I was able to inject it using inject all the things, references to, to follow where you can download that but it, it's um if you're pulling the details out of these loader data table entries that are being maintained in the process address space for example of ping you're able to get load time no joke ping was running so it might be on some of your systems constant network monitoring and then attacker injected into this process address space like what it's not protected it's not a ppl no <laughs> not a ppl by default so you can see here i got 14 51 12 seconds is when ping started running <laughs> 1453 14 seconds is when i decided to inject uh one particular type of uh, I chose a particular technique for code injection that pops open a window, no joke. So inject all the things does a pop-up to let you know that reflexive DLL injection has transpired. And so what DLLs support ping becoming <laughs> something that draws a window to the screen. Do you see them? I mean, anything that starts with G, you're like, yeah, graphics. Yeah, user 32 interacting with the desktop. So notable here. You're not going to see the injected memory section because that's ref I used reflective DLL injection. It should not have any uh, metadata associated with that injected memory range. I'm super psyched. Yeah, that's awesome. But it had dependencies. So it actually, upon it injecting, it called additional DLLs in. And there you go. <laughs> its mission was to pop up something on screen. And I'm like, heck yeah, that is super loud. So triggering event 1453, we found it. Could you find it too? This does require some hosts visibility. What's going on in the host? And I am watching time. I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. <laughs> so you're like, okay, uh, ping has changed its presentation. It's changed its dependencies. And that is not an immediate route for boom, injected with malicious code, but it's a change. And right, anomalies aren't always evil, but we should follow up on them. There should be an explanation as to why something is different. So I take that ping and I'm like, this does not map to the way ping normally acts. And I, I pivot and I start looking for injected memory sections. You may use your tools, uh, your EDR may have that low level visibility to identify memory sections that are not mapped to disk, that are marked as execute. Malfind from Volatility does this fantastically too. You can see MZ header in this memory range. This does not have any associated metadata or information that tells me where it was loaded from, from the file system. Oh my gosh. Like, how did we get here again? <laughs> In summary, pivot two, we were looking for anomalies, uh, just processes deviating from norm. The one that we saw, the one that I made you look at as an example was ping. It had unusual DLLs. So we pivoted and did more of that introspection. Of course, I would look at the paths for the DLLs. Are these in and of themselves rogue? No, all of them check out. And all that could be done, is it digitally signed? Did the digital signature get verified? Sweet, sweet, sweet. But then we go and we say, hey, is there anything that's not represented with metadata? And that's what we were able to do. So good job, good job, anomalous processes. Damn you. So pivot number three, when my, this never happened, but when a tool fails, when the endpoint security tool fails, and let's go in and see, oh, oh, so, we had this happen to us. Did I divulge what technologies we're using? I don't think I exposed our technology stack. But sometimes we will have, we'll say the EDR product, the EDR agent is putting a heavy load on the host. For this reason, it was explained to us, sometimes the host will stop logging to its database, its on-host database. So sometimes we'll have this absence of the most contextual damning information, it would just be gone. I give this to you, I give this to you. So Sir Ito ran, and it looks like someone's decoding. This is a great, it's a great example. 
of how you can use sort, sort Util. The decode, this XLS, and we're going to be pivoting and creating as an output file this PDF. Nice. So thinking about how I can get my files in the door, as an attachment, I'll probably, as an you know, attacker trying to deliver a malicious attachment, there may be some hurdles, some obstacles I have to overcome, like extension, file types, that which is not being allowed to come in as an attachment into the environment. Could I, could I deliver something with a benign or approved extension and then prompt or somehow entice the user to decode it? Yeah, I could totally do that. So, so I got this, I got this. We've created a PDF and that's where I want my user to open. Boom, straight up. We, we certainly are fingers crossed that we can entice the attack or the user to do what we want them to. As I'm looking at this, maybe my eye was drawn to the machine because it was exhibiting some anomalous network behavior. But nevertheless, I'm like, well, what was the precipitating factor? What, what invokes cert util? Because I want to go back and figure out the entire do it kill chain. And I want to see the, the style and grace that uh, the attacker used in order to uh, supplant this rogue PDF and then get the user to open it. So it, unfortunately, as I look at my EDR tool that is supposed to be capturing this process, like all process command lines should be being captured here. Sometimes tools fail and I don't get that. What? PowerShell, it's just an absence of data, but I know that there's some juicy bits that should, could have been captured there in the command line invocation. I am at a loss. So if you can relate, you're like, no, go to your event logs, Alyssa. Maybe if you're aggregating event logs from your endpoints, from your hosts, kudos, kudos. But say too much time has passed, those event logs which we weren't aggregating have overwritten. All I have is this cert util that I'm going back in a historical view and I don't have information on how it was invoked. That kind of sucks. So you've seen this screenshot before. Earlier processes, PowerShell, responsible for WI, responsible for kicking a cert util invocation with the crazy decode arguments. Maybe we want to continue to fall back to earlier processes that ran. This. So let's look again at command line arguments. Let's look again at what memory will tell us because sometimes there is an opportunity to go in and recover information that is not captured. Yes, it requires that that power shall still be up and running for me to grab the command line or for the con host, Ooh, the con host process to still be there so I can query that because it's going to be tracking everything that happens in the context of this married process, whether it be a command line or a command processor or a PowerShell, or you can think of some other stuff too, that create a console. So con host may divulge the information, but I can see here in my, this is simply running command line against your memory dump, all processes that go by the name of power or include power, and I get some insights here. So some things that I could continue to pivot off on, and persistence mechanisms, sweet. And uh, this invocation of encoded commands. So, wow, I told you, I told you we'd make it. This, pivot four. Pivot four is all about anomalous session association. <laughs> so it's a little nerdy. <laughs> I can't think the whole thing hasn't been nerdy, but hey, if I see that a user process, like straight up user, I always know it should be a user process, but yet it's, it's now associated with the system session. So as of the rollout of Vista, Microsoft was like, Oof, we should probably create some type of security boundary for system session, system processes, and subsequent user processes and, and their log on. So it's the, the dawning of sessions, this, uh, session managers and enumerating sessions as additional users log on. So session zero is, is the grouping of system associated processes. And if you see in session zero, something that you know to be true as solely a user, a user process or application, maybe that can be your segue into host-based analysis. You're like, do it, do it, convince me I would ever do this in real life. Maybe, maybe. 
it depends on the level of visibility, your opportunity for that aggregating of EDR. So in this case, we see a slew of ooh, Internet Explorers, oldie but goodie. Internet Explorer associated with session zero. Uh, and this is a Windows 8 system. <laughs> Just remember. And so contextually, there are some other suspicious things going on. This is after a user logged on. Could that help us? But it's not all the time that you're going to see Internet Explorer or any browser running in the context of a user session. But yeah, so there's onesies and twosies. There's one offs where you're going to see a browser associated with the system session, but not normally, you know, and that's what we want to investigate. So that's a lot. It might there be a problem with it in Spacio, of course. So we do a little bit of query as ask the question, well, when did in Spacio? Contextually, it's being kicked off after these crazy Internet Explorers. When did that get added to the system? Is that in a normal directory? Have we seen this before? How prevalent is in spacio.exe? And so this is pulling master file table record out of memory, but please, there's easier ways. There's easier ways. You can pull the creation time and date stamps using all kinds of capabilities that you have at your disposal. We also, uh, because this is a Windows 8 system, SP1, that this is actually viable. We can do an AMCache, the registry hive analysis. And so in doing that, and this is just simply running strings against an extracted uh, registry hive data set. So I'm not parsing it with any sophisticated tool. I'm just running strings against it. I can see in Spacio, and then I can see it's SHA-1. So I'm like, heck, yeah, man, that's enough to go on, grab that, do some research, query, 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 re reputation checks if you can't extract a copy of this otherwise. So there's all kinds of really juicy things that we can look at, but this brings me to pivot number five. Oh, yeah, not, not too long. Pivot number five is about persistence. So some people live and die by the ASAP. And what does ASAP stand for? Auto start extension points, simply auto runs, right? Hmm. Ever since I, I read about uh, DQ2.0, um, I don't like to call it auto runs anymore, but like persistence, the way an attacker is going to keep a point of presence and survive a system state change on the host. <laughs> so many words. So how can I rack and stack? How can, how can I detect anomalous persistence mechanisms? Of course, there is the in aggregate. So I'm going to use my EDR products, and a lot of them have categorization of details that they're going to just like just like sys internals auto runs a lot of we'll use tanium as an example it has an auto runs collection it already has categorized these things so if you just say hey hit these, these thousand hosts pull back auto runs data it will do so in aggregate so you can rack and stack and do data reduction based on frequency of occurrence no it's not easy you're going to be left with a lot of onesies but you can flip through them and realize that you're doing an incredible amount of data reduction right off the top. Other things to note, temporal analysis. So if I know the user because, hey, I have pretty good detections uh, via email, uh, I know the user fell prey to a phishing email before that initial detection and before cleaning uh, all recipients' mailboxes, I can go and look for the registry key write times, the last time a registry key was updated, that coincide with that user clicking a link, that coincide with the time the user posted data. <laughs> so I can see, OK, what are the, what's the impact? What's the change? Temporal analysis can be super helpful. And in fact, let's parlay that into a baseline. If I know what normal looks like across all of my machines, then I can go in the next day and say, OK, what has changed? What has changed? And think about creating a filter of known good in this massive data collection that you're doing for auto runs, you're filtering out everything that's known as it been previously vetted. And then you're like, hey, every day I'm going to pull back more auto runs and things that are new, unknown, will bubble up to the top and will warrant analyst attention. So event chaining, also a good way to come upon persistence. I know recently we covered a ransomware instance that was setting a run once. Yeah. So every time the system would shut down, it would supplant the 
the registry value that was hanging out under current version run once. When it would start up, a user would log in, it would remove it, so obviously run once. Uh, it's only going to do so, and then it's removed from the registry. So it was like tricky, tricky. Um, if I'd hit the box while active, I wouldn't have seen run once populated, but event chaining, a lot of our EDR tools have the ability to say, hey, what happened when? Let's, let's study this particular process and see, like one of the things we're studying is like, hey, show me task manager, show me the times task manager ran and created an LSAS.DMP, right? So that was one of our TTPs for, um, I think, which one? Oh, so many, so many, right? One of the ransomware operators that we're tracking. So I'm like, whoa, can I see a process making changes to registry uh, that, that's in fact unusual. So really tying together context. You did it, you did it, that was five. So I show you a very blurry persistence mechanism, one of my favorites, keystroke logger that has creeped up and we're seeing it affecting all users because it's hanging right off the software registry hive. And so if you were to spot this one day, I, yes, something new, let me go and dig into it maybe based on the last pivots that we just shared together, you'd be like, yeah, I want to know this thing. I want to know what that is. Did the user install it? How did it come to be on the box? All of that. So you want to put it on a timeline. And so that would require some file system analysis. You can see here, beautiful MFT parser from my memory image, all of those uh, born times and blah, blah, blah. But I can see when that executable, the keystroke logger, was added to the file system. And then I'm not giving anything away. What happened prior to that? It's additioned and right to the file system. And then you want to find out, okay, <laughs> how bad is this? How long has it been running? What information has been grabbed? Where is it writing to? So uh, the study of relationships that exist between rogue processes and anything else that they're touching on the box. We've already mentioned network connections. We've mentioned registry keys you know, child processes, parent processes, but what about file kernel objects? So what files does this malicious process have a relationship to? You can see here, I got my keystroke logger. We know that it had a PID of 2612. It has a relationship to this DAT file. Might be of interest. We could pivot and potentially see what it was capturing, the manner in which it was capturing and to create signatures. So heck yeah, that's good, that's good. So I, I'm just throwing these couple of slides on the deck. I'm going to email this PDF of slides, yes, to Ryan so he can put it out there as a link, don't worry. But I did a lot of my, my work just simply using Windows Sandbox. Like, cheater, cheater, no, 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 Windows Sandbox, the feature. And it's pretty sweet, man. Windows 10, Enterprise, or Pro, Pro Edition. You, you probably have access to it. Install it, and then you configure the WSB before you launch it. So you know, host base sharing, double click on that guy, and you have this virtual, clean, super clean uh, Windows machine that's running as the same version as the host. And if you've used this before, then you know I um, am showing you how I injected ping. So the FDisk U GitHub has the inject all of the things tool, and you too can choose how you want to inject your processes. For further study, it's fascinating. You will need to um, install the Visual C libraries because, again, it's a blank slate over there when you launch your Windows Sandbox. But seriously, that is all I had to share with you. That is all. <laughs> Do I have any questions that I might answer? Will I have the deck and my notes in front of me, my cheat sheet? Any questions? So we'll wait for people to throw some questions into Discord. That is all she says. We're all going, one, two, three. <laughs> I, I will say one thing that I love the phrase, particularly accommodating to legacy. Uh, <laughs> sure, that's, that's such a nice way to say our old devs would really call RegServe32 from Word and MS Build might come from PowerShell. We don't know, just run it. <laughs> yeah, well, that is where every analyst is challenged. I don't care how sophisticated, how, how many years of experience you have, if you haven't worked in our, you know, our environment, then you're coming in blind. And that's why it, extra, extra time, if you have a baseline, right, you're saving money, you're saving uh, some cash if you're bringing in a third party analyst and 
and you want to ramp them up quick. Because it takes a while. It takes a while to learn yes, what normal is, what legacy normal is. <laughs>